Ooh, hi everyone. Welcome. Welcome to today's Cyber Conversations. Um, my name is Jupiter Parasa. As some of you may have seen yesterday, I'm the events manager at Manny's. Um, I'm typically in the space setting up um, events and executing them, but now I am here in the cyber realm with you. Um, I am joined by our dear friend, um, Hadar Aviram. Uh, she is a professor at UC Hastings, and today uh, she has this wonderful presentation for us uh, on women in organized crime in modern Europe. That's going to be an interesting um, um, conversation, so I'm very excited. But first, before I allow Hadar to take over, I just wanted to welcome you all to Manny Super Civic Conversations. The first 20 minutes is going to be um, Hadar um, giving you guys the lecture. She has a really cool PowerPoint, so stick around. And the last 10 minutes is going to be Q&A questions. So um, throughout the lecture, if you think of a really cool question, make sure that you go to the Q&A portion that's right below and you put in your question. And we're going to be reading them out um, the last 10 minutes and Hadar will have the opportunity to answer them. And um, you all can also donate to the link that we put in the chat uh, at www.joinit.org slash Manny's. Um, and last thing, Hadar just published this really awesome book called Yesterday's Monsters. She had um, the book release party at Manny's just a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago it seems so long ago but yeah. very recently <laughs> um so i also put the link in the chat box so you guys can check it out it's really awesome it's about the manson family murders um all right so hadar this is your this is your moment mm -hmm. go ahead Alrighty. thank you so much for joining us of course thank you jupiter thank you everybody at manny's for managing this and thank you all for uh tuning in um so when i was thinking what to talk about there's all kinds of things that are relevant to these tiles we're facing, but I figured maybe we could all use a break. So I decided to talk about something that's uh, not related to that at all. And, uh, and in fact, uh, decided to talk about uh, the work that I did with Malcolm Feely, my dear mentor and friend from Berkeley. I work at Hastings on uh, women in criminal justice uh, between 1600 and 1900, so early modern Europe. Uh, and I hope it'll be interesting. And I hope you guys can see my uh, my PowerPoint at this point. Is that is that all working out? Can you guys see the, the PowerPoint? I'm not hearing anything to the contrary, so I'm going to assume it's all going well. Oh, yeah, we see it, hooray. Oh, okay, great, thank you. So, uh, this is work that we've done on and off about uh, women and crime, and our point of departure in doing this stuff was because people tend to assume that crime is a male phenomenon. There's this famous criminology book by Gottfriedson and Hershey, and they just make this statement and they say, gender differences appear to be invariant over time and space in terms of crime. So the assumption is that crime is this thing that men do, women are a very small percentage of it. And over the years, people have treated this pretty flippantly or they offered some pretty overgeneralized explanations for why they think that is. So I'm just gonna share a few of those explanations with you. So, um, the granddaddy of all this kind of like, you know, typifying crime by the type of offender is an Italian doctor who lived in the, in the 1800s by the name of uh, Cesare Lombroso. And he used to do all kinds of experiments with criminals. He used to collect death masks of criminals. There's a, a photo that I took for, uh, in his house, actually, in, in Italy, in, in Turin. Uh, and, and most of his books are about how um, men are predominantly kind of like susceptible to becoming criminal and that there are some genetic features that they have that make them criminal and his assumption we're talking sort of more or less the years that darwin's theories of evolution came up so people became very interested in genetics and evolution and all kinds of things like that and of course these are early days of eugenics and he's starting to say you know i think that what's going on is that uh men who become criminals are just stuck in an early stage of evolution they're not just they're not as evolved they're sort of more primitive more degenerate that's why they're committing crime so why do women commit crime when they commit crime? So criminal women to Lombroso had a unique pathological character. They were basically pathological in two ways. They were pathological because they were women and because they were deviant, because they were criminals. Here are some photos that he collected of, uh, of women criminals. And a lot of people have written about this idea of, of how people tended to think that it's just the nature of women to, to, to commit less crime. And when they commit crime, they commit crime of very particular kinds right, um, sex crime or, you know, all kinds of stuff, uh, stuff that's regarded as stereotypically fe uh, uh, feminine. 
a few of those, a few variants of these kinds of theories that were circulating over the years. So uh, some people in the 50s would write about the fact that women are socialized to be passive, so they don't have what it takes to have the energy to like, commit crime or, or put together a criminal program. Uh, a guy by the name of Otto Polak had a theory that women are sneaky by nature, so they actually do commit a lot of crime, but they don't get caught as frequently as men do, right? And then there were theories in the 60s that what's going on is not so much that women are not committing crime, but rather that the system is more hesitant to prosecute them. So the idea is that the police and the prosecution are chivalrous toward women. women. They don't want to expose them to the criminal justice system and prisons, so they don't prosecute them as much as they do men. And then there were feminist theorists who said, well, women do benefit from this kind of chivalrous theory, but only if they conform to stereotypically uh, uh, feminist stereotypes. So only if women are behaving in a way that accentuates you know, uh, traditional beauty standards or conventional beauty standards or motherhood or things like that, then they receive sympathy from the system. And if they sort of flaunt in the face of those stereotypes, they're actually going to get uh, uh, treated fairly harshly. Because women are generally perceived as, uh, as being a small percentage and always have been a small percentage of the overall offender population, we tend to pay less attention to women in criminology. And when we do, which is largely thanks to feminist criminology, mostly the light that we shine on women is as women as victims of crime, you know, violence against women rather than as offenders. But that raises the question, is this really true? Is this really true that women have always been a small percentage in the subset of offenders? And it turns out that's not true. So about 25 years ago, uh, my friend Malcolm Feely in Berkeley did a completely unrelated study that required him to collect a lot of data from the Old Bailey in London. And uh, in collecting the data and sort of just crunching numbers for a different purpose, he came across something very curious. He found out that the percentage of women out of all offenders was actually quite high about the years, that women were between 30 and 40 of the overall population of, uh, of offenders that were slight less of the population that got convicted. And you can see that the numbers start sort of trailing down in the 1800s until they come to a low in 1895. Oh, there's my research assistant, Gulu. Hey, Gulu, say hi to everybody at Manny's. There we go. So, uh, so Malcolm became very intrigued by this and uh, wrote an early paper with Deborah Little about these pieces. And afterwards, in the early 2000s, he drafted me to come on board for the project. And we started collecting a lot of data. And we were able to go to ancient courts in England, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, and even some US colonies and collect data from hundreds of years ago and actually put all of it in modern spreadsheets and crunch the numbers. And we found out that the data that Malcolm find for the Old Bailey was not an aberration. And we saw a pattern that repeated itself in many European countries over those years. So just to give you some examples, most of my examples at the beginning of the talk are from the Netherlands because most of them, the most complete data sets come from there. They've really preserved well their ancient court records. So these are three types of data sets that we found about Amsterdam. And again, we're seeing the same pattern. We're seeing women being sort of around 40-ish to 50-ish percent of offenders in the 17, early 1700s. And then again, the numbers start sort of trailing down in the 19th century. So there seems to be some really early data that suggests that uh, the numbers might have been low and then rose and then came back down. But the more reliable data that we have are for the latter period, so, so starting with the late 1600s. So this is something I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But one of the things that we did is we tried to take out of the, of the database offenses that were usually kind of you know specifically targeting women, all kinds of sexual morality offenses, night walking, which is a fancy way to talk about sex work uh, at the time, to see if the numbers go down. And we're seeing that they are going down to some extent by not, but not by much, that we're still seeing percentages that are much higher, just to kind of like give you a perspective. Today, you would expect to see the numbers hovering at around 5 to 10 percent. Here are some numbers from Leiden. Now, Leiden is an interesting place because Leiden used to be an empire of textile. A lot of the textile in the world was manufactured by Leiden, in Leiden, and a lot of the people working in the spin houses were women. Leiden had a remarkably high percentage of single head households where there was a single woman who was working in the mills and also supporting children. And nonetheless, we're seeing a really high percentage of, uh, of women uh, doing this. There's Delft, 
Delft was home to a China industry. The porcelain plates, the ones that you probably have seen, the white ones with the blue designs on them originate from Delft. We're seeing pretty high numbers, again, of offenders in the early uh, 1800s before the numbers start going down. Uh, and then you can see on the right side, uh, modern data from the Interpol to tell us kind of like an idea of where things came to in the early 1900s. And we're seeing what the percentages are. They're closer to the way that they look now. What we've done here is we've basically superimposed all of these numbers on top of each other. So this is kind of quick and dirty. It's lots of different databases. The quality varies, but it kind of gives you the same idea that we're talking about this kind of graph that goes up and goes down. And the, the numbers come, come to resemble the percentages that we're used to only at a later period. So this raises the question, what is going on? Where did all the women disappear to? Why are we seeing this high participation of women in crime and we're seeing so little of it later? And I have to say that this is not just kind of, you know, petty crime. We're seeing involvement of women also in pretty serious organized crime. So there's accounts, for example, from Belgium of women who were doing pretty serious uh, larceny gangs, like theft gangs. Women who were intermarried to lots of families. So a woman, for example, would be legally married to one guy, but she would also, you know, hook up or shack up with this other guy and link the two families together. Women who would run the ale house, the tavern in the town, and would be basically a hub for all the stolen property. So we're getting all these stories of women that are actually fairly central in the crime scene. They're very important. They're sort of lubricating the social relationships within the gang, so lots of organized crime activity. So it's not just kind of like petty small things. It's even kind of serious crime that today we would more likely be associating with men. So where did all these women go to? Where, why did they disappear during the Victorian era? So Malcolm and I looked at five possible explanations, and we found fairly good reasons to rule out all five of them. I'm going to go over all five, and then I'm going to give you the explanation that we think explains best what is actually going on. So the first one is a question of whether women were over the years shifted over to lower courts. So we have lots of different levels of courts and the idea is maybe we used to view women more seriously at the beginning of the era and then over the years it became sort of less serious and, uh, and we shifted them over to, to lower courts. But it turns out that's not the case. Here's some data that we collected from Paris. We're seeing uh, the numbers from the lower courts are above in blue. The number from the upper courts are down, uh, are below in green. We're seeing that there's a decline in both. And certainly there aren't enough numbers of women in the, in the higher courts throughout the period to explain uh, uh, what's going on. There's certainly not a movement to the lower courts. There's a decrease there as well. So that's not going on. Uh, and by the way, we're seeing numbers of men and women kind of going in opposite directions in those lower courts, which is kind of interesting. So it's not just that the numbers of men are rising, but also the numbers of women are falling at the same time. Uh, same deal, uh, actually a different deal in the court of seas, which is the higher court, we're seeing the men's numbers going down, but we're also seeing the women's numbers uh, going down at the same time. So again, not a particularly convincing explanation. And this goes to the second explanation, which is some people think, well, maybe it's not that the women were committing less crime, maybe the men were committing more crime. Again, a lot of it, it depends. It's too, it's too complicated to just kind of like nail it and say this is the simple explanation to what is going on. Uh, you can see the graphs again. So maybe what was going on is that women were predominantly prosecuted for typically feminine offenses, which in the late 1600s, if some of you are familiar with Salem, would have been uh, witchcraft and things like that. Uh, maybe women were prosecuted for abortion. Maybe women were uh, disproportionately uh, um, prosecuted for adultery, kinds of things that have to do with female morality and with sort of double standards and patriarchy. And then when those feminine offenses start going down, women's crime starts going down. Well, turns out, no dice. It's not a good enough explanation. Because here are the graphs when we're taking those typically feminine offenses and we're reducing them, we're taking them out of the database. So this is in Paris. We're still seeing the same decline, right? Of course, there's a sharper decline when we exclude the typically female offenses, but we're still seeing the decline pretty clearly uh, uh, when we're looking at the sort of, you know, gender neutral offenses like, I don't know, theft or public order and all kinds of things like that. Uh, here's the, the same picture for the lower courts, very, very similar. So there's actually not a ton of women getting prosecuted for these typically feminine offenses. Uh, this is something that we were able to do because we had lots of definitions in the ancient courts of which offenses is going which way. We're actually seeing a rise in prosecutions for sexual and moral offenses in the latter years of the lower courts, but everything else is going down. So the pattern stays the same. So, so there weren't apparently enough of these kind of which craft, abortion, infanticide, night walking, uh, uh, adultery stuff to explain this general pattern that we're seeing. 
So maybe women were mostly minor accomplices of male criminals. You could be forgiven for thinking that that's the case because uh, there is a lot in literature today when you look at newspaper stories that tell you stories about women who are acting as drug mules for their boyfriends or, or doing kind of like watching while their boyfriend is robbing somewhere. So you would think, okay, maybe in a lot of these times, the guy is really the criminal figure and, and not the woman. Again, turns out that's not the case. We have numerous accounts of women acting on their own. Uh, we have numerous accounts of women acting as 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 heads of of organized crime. So this is not really a, a subset that can explain this. And one of the ways we can test this quantitatively is that in some of the in some of the the, the old registries, we actually have uh, lists of people that that were prosecuted by time. So if there's a bunch of people prosecuted for the same crime, we're seeing them together. A lot of times we're not seeing the women prosecuted together with a and men. A lot of time we just see this. As its own as its own crime, so it doesn't it stands on its own. So not a good enough explanation. So maybe what's going on is that the men were just gone. You know, maybe in times of war when all the men are missing, right? Like Rosie the Riveter, which kind of like the women rise and they're like, okay, we can do it. We're going to do the crime because the guys are gone. So all the crime you're going to see for the village in that year is women's crime because the men are gone. Again, doesn't work. We have data from multiple countries. We have data from multiple cities. We know when the wars were going on, so we know when the men were gone. We're not seeing a difference. We're still seeing the general pattern of decline. So here's what we think is going on. There's basically two things that could explain why women are disappearing. Actually, three, I should say. The first is that women are actually committing less crime, like the women are doing less crime. The second one is that women are prosecuted less often for crime. The third one is that both things might be going on at the same time. And the place where we went to try to figure out why that might be is writings on social, uh, on, on social history. And what we find is that the Victorian era was characterized by a, one of the main characteristics of the Victorian era was a very big gender segregation, a huge increase in gender segregation. So how does this, how does this play out? It's not that there wasn't any patriarchy before the 19th century. Patriarchy was alive and well, but the style was very different. Patriarchy was more public. Women were out in the marketplace, women were out in the alehouses, women were out living public life with men. And because of that, they had more opportunities to commit crime because they were just involved in the life of the town and they came across opportunities to commit crime. In the 19th century, there's a bunch of things that happen. First of all, the Industrial Revolution brings about big machines in factories, and the machines are built differently for men's bodies and for women's bodies. So women don't work in the same factories as men. So they're segregated from men, and that means some of the opportunities go away. A lot of women go into domestic service in the Victorian period, and so the extent to which they go in and out of the house is also pre pretty limited. Now, there's also a lot of messages in Victorian culture that women have to stay home. There's this cult of domesticity, the idea that uh, people should marry for love and enjoy raising their kids and, and, and women's places in the home is actually pretty old, right? It's, it's actually, sorry, pretty new. It's, it's, it's a Victorian idea. So this whole notion that women are sort of removed from, from public life is, is, fairly, is fairly new. So all of this distinction means that the style of patriarchy shifts from public to private. What does that mean in terms of uh, women and crime? First of all, women are out there less, so they have less opportunities to come across, you know, an interesting place that has merchandise that they can steal and whatever, things like that. And they're also socialized to, to occupy more passive roles and to be in the home sphere. At the same time, there's probably a lot of chivalry that comes with this kind of big message that women should be in the house and that women belong in a sphere that's separate from men. So that might imply that there's also less prosecution of women. So that's partly what we think is going on. This is also related to something else that our colleague and friend Lucy Zedner from Oxford has observed. So she says that one of the things that she Victorian England, and she hasn't looked in other countries, so we don't know if this is true for other countries, is that during this period, women go from bad to mad. So a lot of things that before Victorian period would be prosecuted in criminal courts are now being reinterpreted as mental illness, and women are therefore sort of pushed over to asylums and, and a variety of madhouses that existed in Victorian England. So part of the picture might be that the women start disappearing because this message that they get from the culture that they shouldn't be out there being prosecuted for everyone to see, which shouldn't be a spectacle in public, means that they're basically stashed away in madhouses where nobody can see what's, uh, what's going on with them. 
this idea that we had matches some transitions in high literature that uh, our colleague Nicola Lacey has observed. Uh, so Nikki Lacey sees that there's uh, a change in the way that women criminals are being portrayed in novels between the 18th century, Moll Flanders being a very enterprising, um, you know, pretty serious organized crime figure in sort of pre-Victorian England. And then you see books like Thomas Hardy's Tess of the Dubervilles, where there's a woman who's very passive and kind of like, she ends up committing serious crime, but it's all because she's thrown into all kinds of bad situations because of bad men. So this idea that women change from being these enterprising people with opportunities to these people who are more kind of like domesticated and more dependent on men, and therefore if they commit crime, it's somehow kind of like in relation to men, uh, also manifested in high literature. Following Nikki Lacey's work, I did my own little study where I decided to look at not so high literature and I looked at Sherlock Holmes stories. Now, I don't know how many of you are Sherlock Holmes fans, but um, Sherlock Holmes literature at the time was published in sequels and magazines. So people would buy the stories, kind of like, you know, Little Paint Dreadfuls. And what I noticed when I started running, actually running numbers on the descriptions of women in the stories is that in the early years of Sherlock Holmes stories, the women in the stories are described as enterprising, cunning, uh, sophisticated, you know, deceptive. And then later on, there's a lot of descriptions about beauty and damsels in distress. So we're seeing the same pattern of moving from this idea of an enterprising, cunning woman to the idea of this, you know, poor woman. I'm also seeing uh, there weren't any references of insanity early in the early stories. I'm seeing more in the latter stories, which corresponds to Lucy Zedner's theory. So uh, I see some of that as well. Now, I should probably say entrepreneurial female. Uh, people criminals don't completely disappear. There's a new book that just came out by Chris Smith. It's fantastic. It's called Syndicate Women, and it's about women in Chicago in Prohibition era uh, 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 underworld Chicago, sort of you know running drinks and moonshine and being very effective at that. So there are we do know uh, that there still were entrepreneurial uh, female criminals. I want to especially point out a book by Frida Adler called, called Sisters in Crime. Well, where she has this theory and she says, well, because there's now going to be more opportunities for women, now is the 70s, right? Because it's the 70s now and women are going to go out there and we're going to reach equality, right? Not, not exactly, but it was better than before, right? Because we're going to do that, we're actually going to see more, uh, more crime. Uh, we didn't end up seeing more crime for reasons that maybe we can talk about in the Q&A. I will say to finish, there's, there is one caveat I want to make, and that is that there is one category of crime that we found throughout the years had always been predominantly male. And I'm going to let you guess which one. All right. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Men were always violent more than women. So that's something that we see. This incidentally is something why violent women in society, because they're so rare, they're treated with kind of like special vehemence and venom because it's just so rare that it's considered more, uh, more shocking. Now, because this is historical work, I don't want to do this kind of thing that historians called presentism and just say, okay, let's just, you know, deduce things about the present. But I will say that if there's something this teaches us is that it is very important not to forget women and women's prisons when making criminal justice policy. They are just as important and they are there even if we don't see them. All right, happy to take questions. Awesome, thank you, Hadar, that was awesome. Um, and I do have a question from our friend um, Shalab, um, and it was related to the last point that you made. Um, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Hopefully I did co um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but they asked, did the female liberation movement of the 60s cause any difference in the statistics? And she proceeds to ask, but is it true men are more likely to commit violent crimes versus women? Is there a difference in the type of crimes committed by the genders? As you mentioned at the end, men are more likely to commit violent offenses. Anything else you want to add? So, so these are these are phenomenal questions. So, so I'm going to answer sec the second one first, and that is that one of the things that we saw persistent throughout all of the databases is that violence has always been more of a male phenomenon. Sorry, guys, if you're listening, but that's that's what, the, that's what the numbers are telling us. The other thing that the numbers are telling us that I think is kind of interesting is that when women commit violence, it's very particular types of violence. So women would exercise violence against their own children, against children of others. There's a weird phenomenon in Sweden that we saw of women killing other people's children so that they would be murdered rather than commit suicide because of some sort of Calvinist idea that if you commit suicide, you go to hell, as opposed to if you murder, then you still have a chance to repent and go to heaven. So we're seeing different patterns in the way, in the way violence happens. And also to the extent that women commit violence in public, it's usually related to 
kind of public order stuff. So, so, you know, whenever the bakers would raise the price of bread, women got pissed off, right? So that's the, you know, occupy the Bastille type of things, right? The women would, would you know, raise hell and start, you know, throwing things at the bakers. So, so we're seeing patterns of violence that are different. Now, as, as to, the, to the female liberation movement thing, I think that's an excellent question. And um, uh, our colleague Darrell Steffensmeyer actually ran the numbers after Frida Adler wrote the book predicting that there was going to be a rise in female crime and didn't find a rise in female crime. And we think that partly what's going on is that capitalism has added so much to kind of like the way patriarchy works that it sort of cancels out the idea of private patriarchy becoming public patriarchy. That is so much that is different about the modern era that it's very difficult to predict that exactly the same, that it's going to be a reversal of the trend that we saw in the 18th and 19th centuries. So I hope that helps. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, and we have a couple more questions. Um, the next one is from anonymous attendee, John Doe, I am assuming. Um, is, there, is there data from elsewhere in the world not to subject these Victorian cultural forces from the same time period? very little that we can actually run numbers on. And we were very interested in this partly because as you've noticed, this study is very Eurocentric. We don't have anything about Asia. We don't have anything about Africa, not for lack of trying because we, statistics are really, really thin. We do have stories from these places, but the stories, it, it's hard to tell when, you, when you're told a story about sort of a very powerful female criminal figure, it's very hard to tell whether it's typical of organized crime in that time or whether the story is being told because it's so rare, right? And that's why it's interesting. So it's hard for us to deduce, and that's why we can't really crunch, crunch the numbers on it. Okay, okay. Um, the next question is going to be from anon another anonymous attendee. Um, is there any data about crime going down more for women than men as economic situations improved? Good question. That's a, that, that is a good question. And that is hard to generalize for these number, this number of countries for this long a time. And that's also because different recessions and different depressions interact in different ways. I can tell you that if, if you would expect to see differences, it would be in economic crime. And at least in the early eras where women are more integrated into the public life, we're not really seeing a difference because we're seeing women and men involved in the same kinds of crime. Definitely. I should also point out that this is really difficult to test because the categories of crime themselves change over time. Mm, okay. Um, next one is from Henry. Um, any credence to the idea that crime itself has changed? For example, our definition of crime or the types of crime that are most popular, um, white collar crime equals men's jobs. So this is interesting. And obviously, in uh, the 17th and 18th century, there would not be such a thing as white collar crime, because, you know, that was the king and the king just did whatever they wanted. And basically, what you see is that the penal code reflects, this is a pretty Marxist idea. And, and to us, it's not new. But at the time, it would have been revolutionary, right? That the penal code pretty much reflects the ideas of the powerful. So for example, in Britain, the big deal is property, right? You can't poach in the woods that belong to the king, which is a classic capitalist idea, if you think about it, or a rich person idea, because the woods belong to the king, but it's the poor people that don't have anything to eat, and they would be the ones that would go poaching. So to that extent, you would kind of like expect to see maybe differences in gender. We didn't find a lot. But again, we don't necessarily have that kind of granular differentiations. I can tell you that when you go over a penal code, like, for example, the French penal code over the years before the French Revolution and after the revolution, crime does change a lot. So, you know, what mm -hmm. used to be crime against the king now becomes crime against the republic. The whole homicide world changes because there used to be like at least three or four different types of homicide by horse and buggy. And then, you know, as there's less horses and less buggies or the vehicles change or the trains emerge, there's new forms of homicide. So that all requires a really careful surfing of kind of like what the categories are and try to equate them. And that's why doing this kind of work is always a bit of a generalized quick and dirty job. Definitely. Okay. Um, we have two more questions. Our next one is from Adora. Uh, was there any change in the type or frequency of crimes committed by men during the Victorian period? There are people who have studied men's crimes specifically in Victorian England more in depth than us, and you can probably see that going on there. Uh, what you can see mostly in England is a big change after the Black Act came into effect, which happened in 1780. So that would cover pretty much before the Victorian era and throughout the Victorian era. So for example, all these death sentences for pickpocketers, all kinds of things like that, that's all fairly new. And again, this is another form to control the poor. 
Okay, cool. And, and last question from Michael Mahoney. How will the increase of elected progressive district attorneys impact women prosecution rates? Wow. Ooh, that would be interesting. That's so that's one. taking us completely out of the history world and into today's world. Not and the answer is, I don't know, it could strike both ways. I mean, one of the concerns that we have about this work is, is that we're afraid that people will sort of, you know, try to presentize it and say, oh, well, in that case, in order to sort of like bring real gender equality, we have to sort of bring up women's prosecutions to the level that we prosecute men and be less paternalistic. And I think that's a pretty poor solution to what we're experiencing now. We have to bring both down rather than level up. Definitely. Okay. All right, you guys, these are, were all great questions, um, followed by a great lecture by you, Hodar. Thank you so much for that. Um, very informational, very educational. I always enjoy your presentations. I remember the one that you did on on um, Ukraine during the whole Ukraine scandal with Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. That was phenomenal. Um, all right, everyone. So that it concludes our conversation for today. Thank you so much, Hadar, again. And for those of you guys that would like to support Manny's, the donation link is right in the group chat. Um, and tag us online at welcometomanny's.com. Um, and thank you guys all for joining us. If you want to check out all the upcoming cyber conversations that we are going to be having, go to, go to www.welcometomanny's.com. Thank you guys so much, and I hope you guys have a good one. Bye, Hadar. Thank Bye. you so much.